All right, the book of John, seventh chapter. We're actually going to start at verse six. John 7, verse 6 says, So Jesus replied, My time has not yet arrived, but you are ready at any opportunity. He's talking to his brothers. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I am testifying about it that its, that, that its deeds are evil. You go up to feast yourselves. I am not going up to this feast because my time has not yet fully arrived. In other words, you know they want to kill him. When he said this, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then Jesus himself also went up, not openly, but in secret. So the Jewish leaders were looking for him at the feast, asking, where is he? There was a, a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some were saying he is a good man, but others, he deceives the common people. However, no one spoke openly about him for fear of the Jewish leaders. When the feast was half over, Jesus went up to the temple courts and began to teach. Then the Jewish leaders were astonished and said, how did this man know so much when he has never had formal instruction? So Jesus replied, my teaching is not from me, but from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do God's will, he will know about my teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak from my own authority. The person who speaks on his own authority desires to receive honor for himself, the one who desires the honor. Of the one who sent him is a man of integrity, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Hasn't Moses given you the law, yet, no, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why do you want to kill me? The crowd answered, you're possessed by a demon who is trying to kill you. No, you're possessed by a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I perform one miracle and you, and you are all amazed. However, because Moses gave you the practice of circumcision, not that it came from Moses, but from the forefathers, you circumcise a male child on the Sabbath. But if a male child is circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses is not broken, why are you angry with me? Because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath. Do not judge according to external appearances, but judge with proper judgment. All right, so just dealing with this, and if we back back up to, um, I believe it's, uh, uh, I think I'm on, All right, yeah, back at, back, back at seven. It says, the world cannot hate you because it hates me because I'm testifying about it and that its deeds are evil. One of the things that, that we do as believers is we are supposed to represent the truth, right? Um, in order to represent the truth, you have to know the truth. If you don't know the truth, it's kind of hard to represent the truth. Um, but understanding that when people come against you because you're telling the truth it's because you're speaking about their sin you're speaking openly about what's going on in this country you're speaking openly about what's wrong you know and you're trying to to, to to point them to the right direction most people don't want to hear that you know even when it comes to the point of um you know trying to teach our own uh the right way versus the wrong way you know whether or not um you know we should be killing one another and, and how we respond to that, like we respond one way when someone else kills us, but yet when we kill our own, nobody says anything. It's quiet. You know, the streets are quiet. You know, the old adage, snitches get stitches. And, and so people are going um, unchecked and, 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 and people are getting away with murder. And somebody knows, you know, but who wants to speak the truth? And, and, and this is what Jesus is saying, you know, here, here I'm coming, I'm coming to do good. I'm coming to change uh, the narrative, and yet y'all want to kill me. So let me say this to y'all, when you out there amongst your uh, co-workers or your family, um, and you are trying to represent the truth, you know, and one thing about representing the truth, you can't, um, you can't hem and haw, right? You, you, you can't 
represent half the truth when it's you know suitable for you and then do everything else opposite the truth because it's you know you just want to be liked or you want to be a part of the clique you know when you represent the truth you have to stand on the side of righteousness and when you stand with righteousness people are not going to really care for you you know being a pastor is is is, is more than a notion i can't tell you how many folks who have come to the church and you know who profess they love you and they, they appreciate the ministry and all those things um until something happens and you got to check them <laughs> you know you, you tell them about themselves or you point out a truth to them that they really just don't want to hear you know then all of a sudden now you become public enemy number one the ministry has not changed it's just that now the situation has changed and people can't handle the truth when the truth is coming at them. You know, we want to gloss over it. Or it's one of the reasons why I try not to, um, you know, um, what I'm trying to say. I try not to, I be, I'm careful of like where I go and who I, who, I, who I communicate with or who I sit down with or who I eat with and things of that nature outside of the church. Because it was not like a group setting. You know, other than my deacons, I really won't go to anybody else's house unless other people are invited, you know. And, and the reason is, is if I go to one house, you know, and then somebody will say, well, you went there so you can come to my house, come to my house. Or if I go to an individual house and I'm always over there and I'm always like eating or chatting with them, you know, then people believe that that's a closer friendship. And so do they. And so then when something happens that goes against them, you know, that's what creates the animosity. I, I never forget the days of shallow when my father was at Shallow Baptist and, uh, you know, every Sunday, because we was commuting back then uh, from Baltimore, but every Sunday we would go over, um, you know, one of the membership's house and, you know, they would we, they'd have dinner for us and all that other kind of stuff. And because they did all of that, they felt like they were privileged, you know, because the pastor ate there and so they could get different things, but they didn't understand who my father was. And when they could not get the way, what they wanted, you know, then we was just <laughs> politely kicked out of the house. You know, it's like, well, y'all won't be coming up in here no more. You know, so, you know, take that somewhere else. And, you know, the rest is history because once you, once you start not giving people what they want, ergo Jesus, they're going to crucify you. How many of y'all felt like that? You know, when, when you, you try to stand for righteousness, people who, who loved you, and all of a sudden now, because you won't bend to their side, then all of a sudden they don't longer they 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 angry at you they hate you they don't like you no more they don't want to be around you no more. How many folks have experienced that? Floor is open. Uh, can you all hear me? Hello, everybody. Hey. All right. Uh, I experienced some of that. Um, one of the the more prevalent times that I recall is right before I went to Jamaica, and as the Lord began to uh, reveal to me that he had laid all I can say is an assignment on me and mm -hmm. after the Holy Spirit began to lead me in the direction and I began to open up and, and to speak about it I was told you know who do I, who did I think I was and um you don't know what the Lord is saying and you're sick that was a lot um and just a lot of a lot of negativity that I did not expect Right. And it did take me by surprise, but I recall just simply just simply staying in prayer about it. Uh and that kept me encouraged. And then I had those around me that also were encouraging me. But it was something to see from outside, uh, those outside of the, the will and way of plans of God, but then also those that know, you know, that um what it's can be like to be uh, viewed as you think you're better than someone else because now you're doing something that may be different than what they've seen you do in the norm. Right. But it's because of your growth and your walk and so forth. And instead of embracing and uplifting, it was somewhat just, you know, just negative. Right, negative. right. People love to bring up your past. <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah. they, they, don't, they don't want you to leave that. They don't want you to leave that. They don't want you to leave them. So they always want to remind you that, well, you know, what you used to do, but like I told y'all before, 
I, before I didn't know Jesus. Now that I know him, you know, look at me now. You know, so I'm supposed to change. I'm not supposed to be the same way. And unfortunately, many people, you know, say they accept Christ, but they stay the same way, you know, because they don't want to um, separate from friends or they don't want to, um, you know, rock the boat. But yeah, let me just tell you all something. If you know Jesus, you will rock the boat. Jesus rocked the boat. He said it right here. He said, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I'm testifying about it that its deeds are evil. People don't want to be told that. You know, you might used to be a party and now you ain't party. And so you, you try to tell them, say, look, I, you know, I, I don't party like that tomorrow. I don't go and hang out in clubs. I don't go and hang out in bars. I don't, I don't go to drink to associate, to have fun. I, I don't do those things no more. You know, and they say like, oh, well, you think you're better than us? It ain't about being better than you. It's just that my life has changed and now I have a better way. You know, and you have to be able to, to stand and hold that ground because I'm, I'm just here to tell you, you know, being a Christian is a lonely position if you try to hang with the world. That's why you got to have good brothers and sisters in Christ. You got to have a good inner circle that is striving to go to the same place you're going and trying to get there the same way you're trying to get there. That's why you got so much problems in church because you got folks who are in church who ain't really trying to hear what the Lord has to say. They come in there for all kinds of reasons other than worshiping, you know, family go there, friends go there. This is, you know, this is just where I've always been. It's like people talk about they, they members and they ain't been there in years, ain't gave nothing, but yet, hey, pastor, yes, that's my pastor, am I? <laughs> because I don't know you, <laughs> you know? I, I I have no relationship with you whatsoever. I never forget the time, you know, one of our, you know, members had left, but I didn't even know he was a member. I just thought he was visiting his dad, you know, because he would come like once a quarter. I, and this, when I joined, the, you know, when I became the pastor, I didn't know, you know, and they didn't speak up for themselves when I was kicking them out of a meeting because I'm like, yo, only members are in the meeting. <laughs> You know, so I looked like I was I was the bad guy, but I was like, hey man, you should have said something because as a pastor, I should have a relationship with my members, right? You should know me and I should know you. Now, of course, there are a lot of people who come who come to the service and then at the end of the service, they just leave the service. And so I don't have a chance to build that kind of relationship with them, but at least I still see them on a regular and I know that they're there. You know, but when you kind of come once every six months or once a year or once every two years, let me help you out. I, I'm not going to know you. You know, I'm not going to know what you, you know, uh, from what I know is you just want to, you know, you, you're a hopper. You know, you go around from place to place looking for something to either satisfy you or, you know, you just aimlessly wandering about. And so if you ask me a question, I'm going to give you the truth. I don't know you. You know, people say, well, well how do you forget my name? Very easily. <laughs> you know, I don't see you every week. I don't see you on, on a regular. You know, I know your face, you know, and people will get offended. And I'm like, no need to get offended. <laughs> you know, just come up and, 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 and talk to me and build that relationship. But we have to have a relationship with people, genuine people, that will help lead us in the right direction. You know, and if we don't have that, you're going to have the same chaos that Jesus had, you know, except for Jesus was God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. He is a part of the Trinity. He's coming in to, to help the world, but because he's given them that kind of truth, they don't want to hear it, especially the leading priests. You know, they, they supposed to be, they, they the ones talking about who is this man? He ain't been to school. He ain't educated like us. But yet he got all this knowledge. Matter of fact, he has more knowledge than them and they can't stand it. You know how when you're in your word and you're reading the word and, and people give you a, um, a scenario and your response back to them is the word and they're like, well, wait a minute. I, I ain't asked you to get all holy than thou on me. But if we believe us, that's what we go to. We go to God's word. That's what we use for our arguments. That's what we use to present a case. You know, and that's why, you know, when you keep reading, let's get down here. Um, let's go back. Let's go to 14. When the feast was half over, Jesus went to the temple courts 
and began to teach. Then the Jewish leaders were astonished and said, how does this man know so much when he never had any formal instructions? People will get mad at you because of what you learned by reading God's word, and then you try to live by it. They've been in church longer than you, perhaps, and don't know no part of God's word and ain't trying to live by it. They call themselves, you know, seasoned saints and stuff like that. But yet, when they leave church on Sunday, it's a whole different world. It's just like dealing with this whole, um, you know, the crisis now, well, this racism and all that other kind of stuff, you know, people tr trying to figure out how to respond. Well, the only way I know how to respond, even though I'm angry, I don't respond throughout my physical. I respond by my spiritual. Because the Lord has to check me. The Holy Spirit, remember, the Holy Spirit is within us. So if the Holy Spirit is in us, then I have to realize that the sins that are being created by this culture is the enemy, which is Satan himself. And so if I'm going to attack somebody, I got to attack the enemy, not the person. The person, nine times out of 10, people don't realize they're being used, you know, by the devil. They don't understand the spirits that are on them. They don't understand the ear. That's why I said, you know, we, 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 we wrestle against spirits, powers, and principalities in high places because it's true. It is a spiritual warfare battle out there. It is good versus evil. It is righteous versus unrighteous, you know, and as the church, if we are the righteous, then we're supposed to understand and recognize this battle. You know, when you go into um, you go into the military, you have to train. What are you trained for? You train for battle. Who do you train uh, for? Your opponent. How do you train for battle? You have to know your opponent. You have to know their weaknesses. You have to know what they will do, what they won't do. You have to have some kind of game plan against your opponent. And I don't care whether it's battle whether it's boxing, whether it's football, whether it's basketball, uh, any kind of sport, whatever it is you're doing, you have to have a battle plan. You can't just go into the battle with no plan. You can't go in there. You, you can't go to a, a, a gunfight with a knife. You can't go to a knife fight, you know, with fists. You have to understand the battle, you know, and when you understand the truth of God's word and you gotta, you're faced with things that are beyond you, you have to know that I cannot think with my physical mind because if I think with my physical mind, I'm going to be lost in the madness. We got to be stronger than that. You know, we got to be better than that. And we got to speak the truth. And when we speak the truth about love in times like these, it's our own people who think we mad, we crazy, we brainwashed, we've been lost. You know, we've been hoodwinked, bamboozled. You know, because how, how are you going to love somebody? Well, how can I not if I'm seeing the image of God? Remember, I told y'all that we were created in his image. It wasn't that black folks were created in his image. It wasn't that white folks were created. It says that humankind, humans, us, the entire race was created in the image of God. So when I look at Claudette, when I look at Yolanda, when I see Erica and Mary and Bruce and and the, the Richardsons, and I see them, I see God. I have to, because he created us in his image. And so how can I treat his image any less than I would treat myself? Even though I don't understand, because if you think about it too, how did we treat God? How do we treat the Savior? knowing that he paid the price for us, knowing that he died on, on the cross for us, knowing that he got up for us, knowing all that we know because of what we, we read in his word and how we study, yet we still do things that grieve the Holy Spirit. So if we're doing things that grieve the Holy Spirit and he still forgives us, then how can we not forgive others even though they wrong us? And I know it's tough. I know it's hard but it's spiritually correct. And that takes a inner strength. That's why I said people say, you know, you weak. Now, it takes more strength to love you when you hate me than it does for me to hate you with your own hate back. You know, when Jesus sat there and, and they, they you know, we, we, we about to get to it, but you know, they about to tear him out the frame and he is the creator. 
he got a, a you know a host of angels ready to go at his beckoning call. None of us have that power. Because if we had that power, we'd call the angels before we even got to, to see Pilate. The minute they came and picked me up out of the garden, hold, stop, stop, hey, get on. Uh -huh. I, I ain't going for this. You talking about Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane and sweating it out, praying that God remove this cup. Man, you you have the power. So this is not a physical fight, y'all. It's spiritual. We have to learn how to rise above it to help all of us, to help our children, to help our adults. Even that yeah, knucklehead that don't want to understand, don't want to hear, you still got to try to beat some sense into them. There's got to, there's a better way to, to, to go about this than the way than, than the way you're doing it. You know, I believe that's why the, um, the civil rights um, movements were so strong. It's because they, you know they didn't strike back. You know, and when you don't strike back. And the TV is, is is filming this. It allows regular folk, good people, to see the hate that's out there. That's why Emmett Till's mother wanted his her son's body to be. I, I need y'all to see what grown men did to my child, and that helped spark a a, a change in the country. You know, seeing the fact that that that. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff. You know, you, you heard, you know, Trayvon Martin. We heard the gunshot. We heard the, we heard the stuff. And you know, you look at um, all the others. We we we've seen stuff and we've heard stuff. But to watch a man, you know, put his knee, his whole body, his whole pressure, on a most vulnerable part of a person's body, and sit there without a care in the world, that had to resonate, man. Because a lot of white folk are angry. You know, a lot of people are angry at, at what they saw, you know, and, and now we're talking about, you know, change, but change comes at the polls. Change comes uh, when you stay in, in, in their faces and you continue to understand that, you know, while I may be angry at this, I still got love for you. I know there's a better way. And I know that we can turn this thing around. That's why I said you, you're not going to be able to fix the whole world. You're not going to be able to change the whole world. But if you can change the community where you are, that's a start, right? That's where it's the most important for you because you are doing something versus doing nothing. Like I said, I want to have this, uh, you know, a meeting with the pastors up in you. All I can do is call the meeting. I can't make anybody come. But if everybody say they're they so serious about what, you know, making change, then it, it has to start, like, once again, I believe, with the church. I think that's why Christ left us here. I mean, the reason why the world is not as bad as it could be is because of the church. We might not have the power that we had before, but there's still good churches. There's still good people. There are people still praying, and God still loves the church. He still looks out for the church. He's just trying to get the church to come together, you know? And that's one of the things that these kind of crises do from the, because I mean, think about it, y'all. <laughs> 2020, brand new decade. This is crazy. We, we, we just got to the halfway point of the year and we had already been tore out the frame. We've been home for three months plus. People ain't had no jobs, some working in, in dangerous situations. So on top of all this stuff from the pandemic, this one little virus that to shut the whole world down. On top of that, you had floods, fires, hurricanes, you had natural disasters. On top of that now, you got a racial pandemic. <laughs> it's only June, y'all. We got six more months left in this thing. God is trying to reach us. He's trying to talk to us. We got to fix some stuff. We got to start, number one, caring for people, caring for one another, caring for ourselves, and looking out for our brothers and sisters, you know, those who know as well as those who don't know. You know, you can get mad at folks, but I'm telling you, a lot of people are, are crying out right now. 
you know. And the question is, how are we going to respond today? You know, and if Jesus was here, Jesus would respond the way Jesus respond in this particular test. He's just going to keep telling the truth. Whether you want to hear it or not, we you got we got a racist president. It's the truth. Do we still pray for the office? Absolutely, we have to pray for the office. It's still the office of this country. You know, do we have corrupt Congress? Yeah, the corrupt Senate. Yeah, we got corrupt folks all over the place on both sides, Democratic and Republican. You know, but you still you can't check out. You know, sometimes we got to choose the lesser of two evils. You know, but that's why you still got to do your homework. You know, because you, you choose one to get rid of another one, and then you bring another problem into it. And then you got to understand most times on these platforms, these are empty promises. Just to get into office, then to get into office, don't do nothing they say. So you got to know how to navigate this and not lose your mind, not lose your head. Speak the truth where the truth needs to be spoken to. And you got to be able to, to see it. You have to be woke. You have to see what's going on in our country, even in, in our culture. Our culture, which is, um, I don't know, our culture is lost in a lot of the stuff that we present to be us is not us. But 1% has that, has the people's ear. You know, so when you look at our music and our movies and our entertainment and all these kind of things, that 1% gives everybody the, per the perception that that's the 99%. You know, that's why folks were so excited to, to hang Bill Cosby out to dry. You know, Bill Cosby showed something different. You know, a black husband and a black wife, both successful and both, you know, raising their kids, a, a two parent household. Come on, man. Even Disney kill off every one of their parents. They didn't want to see that. So then when this man all of a sudden he goes down, everybody's like, yeah, take him down. You know, but it's like, and then they pulled off all the shows. Well, the shows ain't had nothing to do with him and, and what he was doing. But it, what it does is strikes away the black family. Man, there's no representation of the black family. You got to see all those things. You know, and we, we buy into, I remember when, um, you know, Michael, Mike Vick had the whole dog fighting scenario and my son was feeding off of, you know, the people in his school talking about, yeah, he didn't want his Vick jersey. He didn't want this. He wanted that. I said, son, it, trust me, man. Don't believe that hype. And what that man did was definitely wrong, but he ain't killed nobody. You know, he didn't, he didn't do the stuff that, that, that other people do, that other white folk do, or people, people uh, uh, of other cultures do and, and, and get the, and he got more time than them. I said, this man made a mistake. He paid for his mistake. You know, but when you black, you can't just pay for your mistake. You, you're going to pay for that forever. Uh, you know, if you another color, you, you know, you can pay for your mistake and they, they give you grace. Well, that's part of knowing what the truth is. So we have to be extra careful, you know, about what we do and how we do it and who we hanging out with. You know, I told my son, I said, you, you may work in the corporate world and they may love you, but just remember who you are. So don't be going over no parties and hanging out. You go to the party, you represent yourself, you say hello, you speak, and then you get out of Dodge. Don't develop no relationship where you become so close, you know, that you think you know them because all of a sudden when something happens, okay, you're going to find out who, you know, who you really are. So we have to be careful. And it's unfortunate, but it's the country that we live in. Any questions or comments on what I'm saying? Nobody? Anybody? I got enough people online here. Yeah, I don't think our president is racist. Okay. Well, I don't know how you be, I don't know how you can talk about people, but he's not. I don't think he's a racist president. He's just a person. And when you was talking about loving and forgiving, it ain't that? I don't understand how you can just call people racist like that. I can love, but I can see. I can. I can see. I can see what I can see. My eyes are open, man. Oh, okay. You know, you know, yeah, I don't. Know. I don't understand how God would like us to call people racist. That's what I'm not. I'm not feeling that language. Let me let me ask you a question. Do you think he was all right with with, with you using the N word? Say that again. Do you think he's okay with you using the N word? Who me personally or him? Yeah, you. You think God is okay with that? Um. Yeah. I mean, it depends. When I use the N-word, I use it with people that are accepting it and receive it in the way that I'm 
giving it to them. So it wouldn't be like, I wouldn't use it towards you or certain people, but the people in my circle where we receive it different but the, but than other the, people. The, the world itself is filled with hate, man. And so well, it's it's one is racist. To, say some, to say someone is racist is to show that the character that they've shown us. And so if you don't see that, if you don't see that, that's just something that you know God has to reveal to you. But is it okay for Christians to call people racist? That's oh, yeah, if they racist. Oh, I didn't know that. You have to tell the truth. I just told you Jesus was telling the truth. That's why they hated him. All right, I got you. That's all I wanted to know. I didn't know. I was wondering if it was okay for us to call people racist. You, you said yes, so I'm good. Well, you can't just be good because I said yes. You have to understand. <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in? I, I just wanted to say when you were first um, speaking about <laughs> Michael Vick and um, how um, the thing with the dogs and comparison to someone else's crime and the amount of time he got and so forth. I do recognize, you know, that uh, uh, that being black system, it will show the disparity to us. But as far as our spiritual, we got a mute. We got, look, we got a mute. Some some because you you cut you breaking up. All right, go ahead. Okay. Um, despite how what sin is and how much time is given, I, I'm aware that our spiritual outlook is such that we have to view sin as sin. Right. That it's no different. And so therefore, in our efforts to regard somebody, whether we have dealings right. with them or not, that uh, scripture teaches us sin is sin and to act accordingly, you know, if we're having to deal with anybody that sins against us or that we're uh, having an opinion about, so to speak. Right. So we have to call a spade a spade. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say when I was when I was young, it was certain places we couldn't go. I would go to the movies, and we had to sit in the balcony. We couldn't sit downstairs with other people. That's rest. That's racist. We yeah. couldn't come in the front door. They had a side door where we had to pay for our tickets on the side. We had to go in the side door and go up the steps and sit in the balcony. Yeah. You could not sit down there. And the balcony was never clean. They didn't clean it. And if you wanted anything to eat, you know, you had to, I guess, bring it yourself because we wasn't allowed to go into the concession stands or nothing. And that was because of black. No other reason. That's racist because well, of my race. So I want to caution. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to caution against, I, I completely 100% stand with what is going on right now and the racism that is occurring. But I also want us as black people to understand the prejudice that we have against one another, that we continue to downgrade, bite the hand that feed us, uh, come against the one that stands with you in a time which you're supposed to stand in unity but you come against your brother and your sister in Christ, your brother and sister in, in color, your brother and sister in blood. Before we can fight against any other color, we have to come together as one and with one another and understand that we, we as a people have a major problem and issue. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, but it, it, like I said, but it all stems back from the hatred that was taught us from when we came in. That's why you have, you got, you got dark skin, light skin. You got, you know, the light brown, light, you know, you got curly hair, you got straight hair, you know. We, we, we hate each other for the reasons that we were separated at slavery. You know, and some of us have never been forgotten. I think part of the issue is that we don't understand, we don't, don't pay attention to the history, don't remember the history. I, I don't know how to break it down, but pretty much um, in order to get us to not to come together because they saw that we were stronger when we were together versus when we were divided, they began dividing um, the division between us and understanding that that division is deep seated because it wasn't about um, black people just wanting to be against black people. It was things that were planted within those slaves to keep them divided so that they wouldn't come together and rebel. 
Um, and so we have to understand that as black people, we too have been conditioned to uh, look at white as right in order for us to feel successful or, or to feel equal um, within that. And so it's one of those things I was telling my, uh, my student wanted to go to an HBCU because she feels as though, you know, we're trying to bring people together, but you know, yeah, we're trying to have all these segregated schools. And I said, well, I know for me, going to an HBCU allowed me to be more grounded in my identity as a black woman, you know, than if I was a school that was predominantly white. I said, because when you get out into the world, it's hard to kind of struggle with who are you you know, as this, as a black person, and then also try to navigate who are you, you know, amongst all these white people. I said, but because I was grounded and I was comfortable with being a black person, because I learned history about, you know, Africans and, you know, being, what was, um, how America was built and like how blacks contributed to the building of America. I was fine with myself. I didn't have to have that warring feeling of, do I have to act this way in order for me to be able to play this role in my, I was comfortable enough to be me and if they didn't like it, I knew I could go to another job where we don't have a lot of people who have that background who are doing um, that study on their own because we're definitely not getting that type of uh, education um, in regard in school, you know, as we're coming up. So I feel as though, like Sister Debbie said, like just teaching our kids, um, just basically the whole history of just being black in America and not even just talking about just coming to America, but just what was Africa like? What was Africans doing before they were brought over to America? Yeah, and, 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 and let me just say this. <clears throat> this is why it's so important to speak to the truth. You know, you, got, you, you know, if you see it, you have to call it out. It's as simple as that. You know, you can't sweep it under the rug and you can't act like it's, it's not there. You know, if it's there, it's there. You know, like when Reggie was talking, you know, about, you know, uh, you know, having to go in the back door and verses like that, you know, what else do you call it? You call racism for what it is, racism. You know, classism, you call it whatever you want to call it, but if one group of people think that they're better because of the color of their skin or whatever the case may be, you know, that's something that is not truthful. You know, and we have to be able to call those things out, but we stand on God's word when we call it out. It's just like, um, where am I? Uh, uh, 18, the person who speaks on his own authority desires to receive honor for himself. The one who desires the honor of the one who sent him is a man of integrity. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Hasn't Moses given you the law, yet not one of you keeps the law? Why do you want to kill me? The crowd answered, you're possessed by a demon. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus replied, I perform one miracle, and you are all amazed. However, because Moses gave you the practice of circumcision, not that it came from Moses, but from the forefathers, you circumcised a male child on the Sabbath. But if a male child is circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses is not broken, why are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to external appearances, <clears throat> but judge with the proper judgment. If you see it, you got to call it. It is what it is. You have to speak the truth, you know, and what I'm seeing, you know, even when it comes down to, and I'll hit back on, uh, on, uh, on, on Kyle's point on that one is, you know, what, what, is, what is it that a man who, who says, I wish this was the old days again, and this is how we used to, we, you know, let's take them out and handle them how we used to handle them. What, what, what is that? That's not what we do, but we know what he was referencing. We know what he was referring to. And that was lynching and hanging and all those things for those people who got out of line who did not believe what they believed. You got to be careful and you got to be woke. And you got to be able to see, and you have to speak the truth. And because Jesus spoke the truth, they wanted to kill him. They didn't want to hear it. You can't be afraid. Not, I didn't say lie. They have to present themselves. They have to show themselves. And everything that Jesus spoke about, they showed themselves. You know, they was mad because he healed a man on the Sabbath day, but yet they do everything else. He said, not one of you, if your donkey, if your ass fell into a hole, would you not go and get him? On the Sabbath day, you're not going to leave that animal down up in there. But yet here's a man who's sick, 
and, and, and been sick since, you know, uh, birth, and he gets healed, and all y'all mad. Y'all hypocrites. You're double-minded. You know, and so we got to we gotta do better than what we do. And like Sister Nikki said, she's right. You know, a lot of times we hate ourselves. You know, and we have to retrace why we hate ourselves. We got to go back to it, and we got to stop hating ourselves and start loving ourselves as well as loving others because, like you said, how can you love somebody else when you only love yourself? So we struggle with something. So there's a whole lot of battlefronts that are going on. So that means that the enemy is busy, you know? And when it comes to God's word, I believe that is the only thing that heals the lost soul. It'll give you a perspective on who you are. When I realized that I was made in the image of God, that gives me something extra that I did not have. Because I'm not just somebody. I'm not just anybody. I'm a child of the living God, you know, who came down and died for me before I was even born, you know. And so because of that, I will stand on the truth. And I will call anybody whatever I need to call them if it's the truth. And it's what I see is what's being revealed. Because you can only, the Bible says you can tell them by their fruits. So as I see your fruits, I'm going to call that out. I'm going to bring awareness. And that's how we make change in this country, by bringing awareness to what's going on. You know, you got, you got the, the, the man's own general said that he, since he's been in office, he's done nothing but divided people, divided the country. How does a, how does a four-star general, and you got to understand command, you got to understand chain of command. Those who are in the military, they know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, when you break chain of command, there's something going on right there. You know, because most times they will say silent, but they see what's going on in the country, and you got to understand that everything that's happening to us is on his watch. We got to be better. We got to be stronger. We got to pray. We got to seek God's face, you know, and we got to not look at the circumstance as a complete physical loss, but look at it as a spiritual awakening. It's time to stop sleeping. It's time to get up. It's time to make some noise. It's time to call a spade a spade. It's also time for us to be on our knees, continually in prayer, you know, trying to help our fellow, our, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, black and white all colors you know you reach out to everybody christ died for everybody that's why you pray for everybody we have no idea who the, who the called are all we know is our, we have an assignment and our assignment is to go out and tell the truth if we see someone in need we're supposed to help them out you know we can't just let people fall by the wayside because they they don't have the same status as us they don't have the same um you know background as us they don't have the same color as us you know we look out for people as a whole you know, and that's, that's one of the, the, the great things, you know, about um, truly, I guess, being the president of the United States. You have the opportunity to look out for everybody. You can't just look out for one side. You have to look out, you know, for the whole. And that's why, you know, why I didn't agree with a lot of stuff that Obama did as, as it relates to gay rights and all that other kind of stuff. I get it. He wasn't the president of the church. He was the president of the United States. And the United States is compromised of all of these people, all of these individuals. You know, so you got to try to find a common ground somewhere in order to lead people. Whether, you know, right or wrong, you got to understand your faith. You got to understand where you walk. If, if it, had it been me there and my faith, I wouldn't have went in that particular direction. But I still got to look out for everybody as a part of my country. So those are things that are, are, are you know, those are, those, are, those are sticking areas. You know, that's why you said you got to figure out, you know, what's the lesser of two evils. You got to pick and choose somebody. Because whether you pick or choose or not, somebody's going to be in office, you know. So you might as well do your own homework, get in there and make your voice heard, make your votes count, you know. But more importantly, when we got situations like this and crises like this, speak to the truth, you know. I have a lot of white friends, you know. We talk, we talk quite a bit, especially in the fishing community, you know. I even, even on my fishing channel, I always put, I, I always interject with stuff, you know, about. Uh, fishing in life and, and living and experiences, you know, and not one of them is saying, well, you know, Revy, you wrong on that one. And we don't all agree. You know, and trust me, we agree to disagree. You know, but there are folks who will go one way or go another way, but when we come together, it's still, we're still able to sit down and to communicate 
and the talk versus those who, because you don't believe what I believe, I don't believe what you believe, then, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm totally out of the picture. Because if you're totally out of the picture, then how do you help one another? How do you have the conversation if everybody is stuck on one side of the fence? You got to be able to talk. You got to be able to sit down and reason together. That's one of the things they did in the Bible. That's why philosophy was so big. All they did was they sat and they talked. They got together and they debated ideas, you know, to figure out exactly, you know, what this side said versus this side and, 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 and come into a common ground somewhere. You know, you got Calvin and, uh, Calvin and, and, uh, and, and, and um, Arminian, you know, it's a battle of, of free will versus, you know, choice. All of those things are, are, are up for debate because as humans, we know in part, and we prophesy in part, you know, it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal truth in the midst of madness. That's what I love about God's word. That's when I read God's word. When I see things like this, it helps me to know that there's hope for us. We're not lost. And you have to stand on truth, even when people will come against you. You know, you can't be afraid of the truth. You know, Martin Luther King is dead because of the truth. He, he's not dead because he lied. You know, if he lied, he'd still probably be alive. But when you tell the truth, they're going to come out. They're going to come after you. You tell the truth that people don't want to hear, they're going to come after you. Even when it came down to Malcolm X, he was telling the truth to people, that, especially when he flipped from his original Muslim background to Islam, you know, he was exposed. He was telling the truth. And they killed him. They had to silence him. Jesus was telling the truth, and they killed him. They had to silence him. So when you are out there and you are walking in God's grace and in God's favor, you are obligated to tell the truth. You can't sit there and worry about what somebody's going to think or what they're going to feel. You got to know that if you're going to tell the truth, it's because the truth needs to be heard. The Bible says the truth will set you free. The truth is it. The truth is what, is what, is what matters in the end game. Can't be afraid. You know, if you're going to be a preacher, preach. You're going to be a teacher, teach. You're going to be a leader, lead. But lead with the truth, not with lies, not with falsities, not with things that are made up, not with so-called fake news, and not with all of that stuff that brings divisiveness to more people. Speak truth. That opens up the ears and the eyes of everyone. You know, and that's what we're looking at right now. We're looking at truth. It's in your face. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to just sit there and, 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 and sweep it down in the rug, let it go? Or are we going to start speaking to those that are around us as well and say, look, that's enough. You know, it's time. To, you know, that silliness got to go. We need to do better. Yeah, no worries. So you have to make a, your mind up. You got to make a decision on what you're going to do. Any questions or comments? I got a comment. Yes, sir. Um, I'm just, I'm really, you know, with this whole thing, it's really hard for me because I hear a lot of preachers that I listen to. Um, and, uh, you know, some of your messages, it's like they're changing from a Christian preacher to a black preacher. And it's real difficult for me because I, I see all this in the news, but I've been there and done that. You know, when I was growing up and, you know, we had, you know, after police, racist songs, you know, go against Whitey. And I was, I, I had a knee in my neck. You know, I, I was in jail, wrongfully accused, and we didn't have enough money for a lawyer. I had to plead guilty, you know, you know, wrong incarceration. I kept going through these things and everyone kept telling me it was racist. It was racist, uh. Ray, Ronald Reagan was racist. Um, the Bushes was racist. You know what I mean? And we had an excuse to go out here and be violent and call people racist and, and use derogatory words towards white people because that is what is coming down on us. But when I started, when, when Christ started coming into my spirit and the Holy Spirit started dealing with me, he started changing my life and started showing me that it's not about right or wrong. It's about me. And those words that I grew up with, 
you know, they started violence. You know, I call white man racist. It's, it's a word coming back to me. So it's going to be a fight within two minutes or less if I go out there and call this white man racist. So when I changed that language and God changed that spirit in me, and it took a while to change that because all we knew was whitey was wrong and racist, and it was everyone. And so now when I see this, everyone thinks it's new. You know, and I talk to a lot of my people that was my age. I'm like, why aren't you out there protesting? And they said the same thing. We've been there and done that. I, we came up from out of that. And now it's a lot of good people trying to draw me back in to this same language that God, Christ, brought me out of. And I'm like, why am I thinking about that? You know, and I was reading Galatians, and, and Paul was saying he brought us out of the law. You know, it's right and wrong out there, but then it's Christ, and that's the level that he brought me to. And now when I look at the right or wrong, I don't judge or call them out. I go to Christ now. And that's, that's why I have a, a difficulty because a lot of the people that I admire and I've been, you know, that, that taught me the word, it's like just because it's popular now, now we can now, you know, now we can go back to the right and wrong. And, you know, we 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 were we we were being called racist or, you know, it's like they're going back to that, which I was already out of. So it's real difficult because that spirit, you know, going out there protesting uh whatever, um, what do they call it? Uh a good protest or a bad pro regardless, it's like we've I've already been there. You know, so it's just real hard to bring those languages up and this talk again when I'm like, let's go to Christ. Let's go to the word, which can bring the, the you know, I don't know if them people are out there saved or not. You know, so I don't know if I'm supposed to be jumping on your bandwagon on, and I don't know what life you're living. You know what I mean? So the things you go, and I feel sorry for everyone that has been murdered or killed by cops and wrong. You know, but then I look at Chicago had 18 murders this past weekend. You know, so. I don't think it's black. I don't think it's white. I think people need to get saved. And then you're going to be on a different level. You know, so I don't have that time to judge, you know, who's right or who's wrong. You need Christ in your life. And if we have Christ in your life, I just don't believe that we would use those certain words. And it just stirs up a something up in me that was already brought up that I don't want to bring up again. And that's not, you know, towards you. It's not towards these other preachers. It's just how I am feeling right now you know these last couple of weeks has been tough because this language is different now you know it used to be about christianity now it's about black <laughs> it's about white you know and i'm I like don't, lord I don't, my... I don't i don't think that the language has changed i think the language has always been the same i think that it's it's more of awareness now because i because i know you said the difference between black preacher and christian preachers you know and I, I don't know the difference. I don't. I don't understand that particular statement because it's 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 always still Christ. Christ has never left the scene. So you know, I, I guess I'm a little confused on the um, I guess the dialogue of what's being preached about or, or what are you referencing as to being preached about whether it's being like just black preaching or Christian preaching because Christian preaching it should be what it always is and when you speak to the truth it does not take away from Christian preaching. The reality- well, They're using, we, they're we using language like, like, you know, like racist or, you know, we need to get ours now, you know, stuff that's like, you know, and taking sides for an example, you know, when in Christ there's no side, you know, that racist president could be right by us in, in heaven. You know what I mean? So they never use words like that or took sides. They, you know, the, the word attacked everyone, you know what I mean? Equally without prejudice. But and now think, it's with, that, it seems like it's with prejudice now. Well, I, I think that you have to be careful when you listen to the message. You know, I think that you have to be careful when you preach the message. You know, I think that it's 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 about all of us. And it's about bringing all of us together. And I and I, I pray that when I when I was preaching, that my message was still all inclusive. But I'm I'm still pointing out I'm pointing out everything that I see. You know, from uh, 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 from our own community that have problem with ourselves. Uh, to the white community that has problems for those who are racist because everybody's white ain't racist. You know, people are out there uh, protesting, trying to help together. But, you know, the protest is a thing that's old. The question is, where do you move forward from this? You know, these people are protesting now is pretty much a younger generation who have never been a part of that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot of young people out there mobilizing, trying to get their voices heard and things of that nature. But that's what I'm talking about as far as you got to be able to see the whole thing 
and you got to be able to run it through the filter of the scriptures because you can't leave Christ out of it. You got to have Christ in it, but you still got to speak to the truth. You know, in order to reach somebody, you have to come down their street because if you suck and jive around it and act like it ain't there, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus came out on their street and called them out. He went to the temple and turned the temple upside down because they were robbers and thieves inside his house. You know, those are inflammatory words too, but if it's got to be spoken, it has to be spoken, and that's why they killed him. You know, when you walk this walk, you are going to be in some situations that are very uncomfortable, and that's where God has us because when you're in an uncomfortable position, when you got to say uncomfortable, uncomfortable stuff, because you got to lean on God. The Spirit is the only thing that can bring you through something like that. And a lot of times, you know, the Spirit is the only thing that can help you when you want to go back home and just be quiet and you want to shut up. You know, so there's a lot of stuff going on out there. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of hurt people. You know, and people may be mis mis misusing the, uh, the scriptures to uh, represent a case, but you have to know the scriptures as well to know that, okay, that's not, that's not the right way. I got to be able to see Christ in everything that I do. But when I see Christ, I still have to see the truth as well. You know, and you put all that stuff together, you present the argument that needs to be presented. A man that is carefully uh, um, processing his thoughts and speaks his thoughts, people can understand and people can see. If I'm going off and I'm half cocked and I'm all over the place, people can see that as well too. Whatever the message is, has to be consistent. You know, and that's what Jesus said. Y'all sitting there, y'all mad at me, but I'm, I'm coming from the one who sent me. I'm not trying to glorify me. This don't do me anything. I'm trying to glorify the one who sent me. You know, and when I try to glorify the one who sent me, unfortunately, because of the way this world is, that puts me on the chopping block. Can I handle the chopping block? Absolutely. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is within me. You know, if I make it out, I make it out. If I don't make it out, I don't make it out. But you cannot be afraid to call a spade a spade when you're trying to change a country. Um, then Paul... Um kind of do that in regards to when he saw the treatment of the Gentiles by um, by Peter and just even yes. thinking about Stephen, how Stephen got killed because he called the Pharisees and the, um, and the Sadducees out as well. So I think sometimes what happens is that um, when we are not grounded, in, especially at the beginning, when we're really not rooted in the word at the beginning, we you know, have some people who um, kind of get us to see Christ in a way that we, we're going to go with because we're new in this walk. But then as you kind of learn the walk for yourself and you actually learn the word for yourself, you have to see that there are some people that you trusted to know the scripture that don't, really don't know the scripture like that. And so, and I'm talking from experience with my mom. There's certain times I just can't have it with my mom because we're not reading the same thing. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like you, you can't tell me to do this because that's not what the word tells me to do. So I have to know the word for myself so that when she says something to me, I can look at her and be like, oh, yeah, that's not it. That, that's just, that's definitely not it. And just understanding that if I call you out on something, I'm not being judgmental. I'm holding you accountable as a, you know, a brother and sister in Christ. That's wrong. Like what you're doing, your methods of doing it, it it's wrong. So I'm not saying that you're, you know, oh, you're going to hell. I'm just saying, no, what you're doing right now, is it, that's wrong. It's dead wrong, whatever the wrong is. If you're an adulterer, adult, calling somebody an adulterer can go ahead and get you slapped inside your head because people don't want to hear that. Telling somebody that you're homosexual, that can be fighting word, gay, whatever. So if you're calling out the sin, like that's not wrong, calling out the sin. And if you're racist, that's a sin because you're oppressing people. And God, Jesus talked all throughout the scripture about oppression. And that was one thing that he wasn't for. And he called people out for and you can't oppress. He even called his own disciples out. You're not going to take the kids like this. Like, leave the kids alone. And anybody who goes and bother the kids, you're going to have to deal with, with my father. So we just have to understand um, that when we call sin out, we're not telling somebody you're going to hell because we don't have the right to judge that. But we're calling that out and saying, look, this is the sin that I'm seeing. So if you want to have a conversation about that sin and why I see it that way, okay, if you have an issue with that, that's, the, you know, I'm just telling you what I see. You ask me something, I'm telling you. So that's how I kind of so. and, 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 but, you know, it's all in your approach as well. You know, if you come in to, to, to antagonize or you come in to help, you know, if I'm coming to help, I'm coming to you as sincerely as I know how, but I'm telling you that, you know, what's going on is, 
is wrong, you know? And so it's one of the things that we had to deal with, but you have to know the scriptures to understand. You got to know where to get in and where to get out. But even when your spirit is troubled, you got to lean on the Holy Spirit. You got to lean on the Holy Spirit to guide you through this because it's your silence that may keep somebody from growing or recognizing their own sin. You know, you got to be able to call it out because when you call it out, then you let them know, I recognize what's going on. Now, let's deal with this particular issue. If not, then what's the use of preaching? You might well shut all preaching down, you know, because all preaching is supposed to call out sin. It don't mean we hate anybody. We love everybody. And that's why we call them out to sin. When you, as a parent, when you discipline your child, you don't discipline your child because you hate them. You discipline them because you love them. You know, and some of the stuff you say is, is hurtful, you know, but you're trying to get them to a point of understanding, hey, we got to be better than this. You got to do better than this. And so you're going to speak from a loving position, not from a hating position. You know, and you're going to be saying some hard words that they just need to be able to hear and understand. You know, I, I, guess I never get a time when I whipped my son, you know, jail when he was young. And at, after I finished and I explained to him, he came up and hugged me and said he loved me. That's love. I, I, I wouldn't beat my child because I hated him, you know, but I had to set him straight and I had to show him the truth and I had to tell him what's right and what's wrong. So those are things that we deal with, you know, and, 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 um, you got to have thick skin to be a, a Christian. I'm sorry, to be a soldier, you got to you got to be prepared for this battle, you know. And you cannot be afraid to call a spade a spade. If it shows you its color, that's how you address it, you know. If it don't, you can't speculate. You have to see it. If you see it, then it is what it is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is 7.15. We are definitely beyond that hour. I'm thankful for all of those who came in uh, to be a part, those who chimed in, those who sat and listened. Um, as always, though, if there's ever any questions or a thing that you want to discuss with me, I'll be happy to discuss anything with anybody. That's what we do. Um, so, and, 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 and whatever I say is not that I'm telling y'all to just go with what I say. I'm telling you to dig into them scriptures and the, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you just like he's, he's revealed to me. You got to be able to see it, but you got to really be in there and you got to study that word and hear because you got to hear from God's heart. It's not just our heart, it's his heart and how he will respond to a situation and how he would address a situation and how he would attack a situation. All those things have to come into play because, you know, what we do is we follow the truth. And unfortunately, this world does not want to hear the truth. You know, if we flipped the script and made everybody happy, then yeah, man, we could be busting out of the seams. You know, but then we're not doing our, our responsibility as a church. We're not we're not fulfilling the call of God. You know, I, I think it's good when folks are angry with you. <laughs> you know, big people are mad because you must be doing something right. Because everybody loving and laughing and happy, then you you giving people something that uh, God didn't quite say to give them. And we got a whole lot of that going on the day right now. That's why churches are so kind of lost and mixed up and so segregated. There's a lot that we have to do, you know, and until God calls us home, we always have an assignment. People say, what's my assignment? That's part of your assignment, you know, learning how to reach out to people who don't like you, you know, and trying to figure out how to bridge this gap somehow, you know, and pray through these situations, you know, but I promise you, though, you still need a strong group with you. It's going to have to help carry you through this madness because some of this stuff can be quite depressing. Like Sister Deb said, 12 year old girl had a meltdown, you know, because she just don't get it, you know? And so we have to school her. We have to educate her. We have to let her know that yes, it's some difficult stuff, but we can get through this, you know, this too shall pass. And you, you know, you always got, you know, a loving grandparents and, and family and friends to lean back on when you feel like you got nowhere to, to go. Yes, you do. And we got to let them know. You know, suicide is not an option. Hanging out with a gang is not an option. You know, hanging out with people who hate uh, e each other or hate the world is not an option. We have to let them know that there is love right here and this love will provide truth and will lead you and carry you even through some dark times. That's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. All right, so um, I need, go ahead. I need uh, no, I said, I just said amen. Okay. All right. So, um, 
I need somebody to pray us out. Somebody who, who's bold enough to pray us out. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you right now, Lord God, for what we discussed today, Lord God. It's a whole lot. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and the wisdom and understanding, Lord God. And we're going to get through this because we're following you. It's all about the truth. And that's what has set us free. We just thank you right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we just thank you. Amen. 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 God bless everybody. You can take off your mute, say hello to everybody, check in, chat, and do whatever you got to do before we close out for the night. Hey, y'all. Hey, everybody. Hey. 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 Hey.